What is going on, family? God bless you on this beautiful day, Saturday, April 24th. I hope that you and your family are doing well. God bless you wherever you are watching from. Please let me know in the comments and I would love to say hello to you as well. God bless you. And I'm happy to be here once again and to start another sermon series called The Bible Said What? And I think uh, it's going to be a blessing, not only for me, but also for, for those who watch on a constant basis. Hey, I want to share something very cool with you that I, I recently came to. Man, it's a video and that, you know, uh, uh, that some folks are dancing and they are happy. Let me show you. Let me show you guys right now. Look at, it. Look at this. Some of the kids, look at how they move. Man, look at that happiness. <laughs> that is awesome. Are we happy like they are? Look at it. They're just so happy and so content with a plate of food, man. Oh, my goodness. I wish I was there. Look at these kids. Look at these kids. Oh, and they know how to move as well. <laughs> Man, are we happy with the little things that we have in life? I don't know what they're saying, but I love it. Are we happy, folks? Are we happy with the little things that we have in life? Look at this guy too. <laughs> he is just enjoying himself. You know, I watched this video and I was like, man, I think that God is calling us to be happy with the little things that we have in life. Instead of focusing on the negative, what are you thankful for today? What do you have with you that you can say, Father, thank you so much. And perhaps you can do a little dance for the Lord. Hey, David dance, right? And I think that we, sh we ought to do so as well. God bless you. This beautiful day. And as we uh, do this intro video, I want to definitely jump in into this message today. But before, though, before we do so, let me pray with you. Father in heaven, I want to thank you, Lord, so much for this day because this is the day that you have given us to enjoy before your presence father father today i want to give you thanks for the little things in life for a plate of food for family for health for the not so much for the big things father but for the little things Lord, i pray for those who are watching right now a special blessing father that you may open our eyes to see your beautifulness to see your grace and to have that joy that you want to give us that our joy may be full that our joy may be complete in the name of jesus i pray amen and amen The Bible has some stories that sometimes are a bit hard to understand, at times too graphic, I would say. Today's story is one of those. Let's open our Bible to the book of Judges, chapter 19 and verse 1 to 4, all right? We're going to look at the book of Judges, chapter 9, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, book of Judges, chapter 19 and verse 1 to verse 4, and the Bible says the following. And it came to pass in the those days when there was no king in Israel, mm, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took himself a concubine from Beth Bethlehem of Judah, but his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there four whole months. 
Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. And having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him. And he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. The story begins with some kind of, some key details, right? Um, that we do not, that he doesn't want us to miss. First of all, it says that there was no king. There was no judge. Israel didn't have anybody who were guiding them, who were blessing them, who were correcting them in their wrongdoings. It seems that the story already from the get-go says, look, during this time, everybody was a mess. Sin was rampant. And even though they were the people of God, they were definitely not right with the Lord. And to illustrate this same thing, it goes on to say that there was a man, but not any kind of man, but a man who was a Levite. And as you may know, the Levites was a tribe that God had separated for a holy work. They were the priests of the nation. They were the example of the people. They were the ones who worked in the sanctuary before the presence of the Lord. They were the spiritual leaders of the nation. That is why the story is very specific about the man who lived in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He was a Levite. He had status in the community. But it says that he took a concubine from Bethlehem. Not a spouse, notice this, not a spouse, not a girlfriend, but a concubine, which is a person who is more than a girlfriend because she lives with you, but not a wife because you didn't go through the legal process of marrying her, right? And for some reason, his concubine becomes angry with him and he leaves and she leaves. She goes on to stay with her father for four months. And after these four months, then the Levite goes on to search for her, meets the father-in-law for the first time. And after a few days, and after a few days, they depart, right? Fast forward to verses 22. They finally arrive at a town where they are received into an old man's house. And verse 22 says the following. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house, that we may know him carnally. Mercy. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, Now, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, Please do not commit this outrage. Verse 24. Look, there is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. But the man would not heed him. So the man took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her. All night long until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was. Till it was light. When her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. There was his concubine falling at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, Get up and let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey. And the man got up and went to his place. When he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt 
until this day, consider it, comfort, and speak up. Wow. Mm. These are some pretty strong words and images, right? You may be asking yourself right now, wait a second, is this in the Bible? What in the world is this? Well, yes, it is in the Bible. But one thing that we must remember is that the scriptures are telling us what happened here and not that these events or things are actually endorsed by God. Yes, both the Levite and the old man were, are encountered in a very difficult situation. Evil men want to have sexual relationships with another man, and they both knew that this is an abomination before the eyes of the Lord. But I don't think that that was their only concern. More than the abomination, I don't think this Levite man wanted to get gang raped, right? I mean, who does? Also, notice that in this life, that, that in this situation, that in this life and death situation, in this difficult situation, there is no cry out to the Lord. There is no prayer. There is no seeking the Lord. And therefore, in their own mind, just as we are going to learn later, they did what was right in their own eyes. And that was to give up his concubine to be gang raped by these men outside their door. So, after the Levite takes his, this woman by force and throws her out, hoping that they'll satisfy their sexual needs, he goes back inside and to sleep. And for the record, I want to say that these are not the actions of a man of God. These are not the actions of a heart filled with, these are the actions of a heart filled with pure evil. And this, friend, is the works of the devil. When you go through the story, I don't know about you, but for me, it fuels me with anger and my disgust for sin grows. This is the real face of sin, you know. This is the kind of nastiness that some people, not knowing, like to play around with. If you want to get a taste of what sin is like, then this is it. Gang rape. The story of this poor woman who is not only raped, but dies from it. In chapter 20. After the Levite cuts her up in pieces and sends them to the 12 tribes of Israel, they all come together in shock and asks him, hey, tell us what happened. Now, you might be asking, why cut her up in pieces? Well, some believe that King Saul, who later came from Gibeah, effectively mustered troops by sending pieces of oxen and threatening that all who did not join him would have their oxen cut up like that. So in the action of the Levite, he was so angry that he wanted revenge for his concubine. And by sending her pieces, by sending pieces of her, he was asking the entire nation of Israel to help her, to help him avenge her death. And they do. They found out that the Benjamites are the responsible for such evil thing. They call them out to battle and the Benjamites reply with a yes, will fight you back. And what I find interesting is that when the Benjamites receives notice that the entire nation of Israel is declaring war against them because of an evil act that a few men from the tribe did to a poor woman, the Benjamites don't seem to care about it, right? They don't look for the responsible ones. They don't look for the criminal ones. They don't hold anybody accountable and it almost seems as, the, as if they don't care. And you know what? This, my friend, that is so scary. I don't know about you, but when I see that, that is so scary. A team of journalists at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram spent nearly nine months investigating a pattern of sexual abuse 
in a loose network of independent fundamentalist Baptist churches, recently unveiling their findings in a series of articles entitled Spirit of Fear. In their investigation, the Star Telegram journalists spoke to over 200 people concerning at least 412 allegations of sexual misconduct in 187 independent fundamental Baptist churches. Despite the use of the word independent, the reporting said many, many of the churches were connected with each other, independent uh, fundamental Baptist churches through colleges and pastoral friendships. And those connections, as well as the church culture, allowed abuse to flourish and abusers to move around the country without any consequence. In other words, I'll take you out of this church and place you in another one across the country. Stacy Shiflett, an independent fundamental Baptist pastor in Maryland, confirmed certain cultural makers where abuse tends to occur. The philosophy in it, uh, the philosophy, right, which is flawed, is you don't air your dirty laundry in front of everyone. Pastors think that think if they keep it on the down low, that it won't impact anyone. And then the other philosophy is it's wrong to say anything bad about another preacher. Well, according to Tammy Schultz and Sally Schuer Canning, professors at Wheaton College, church leaders need to be prepared to deal with these issues by cultivating a culture of respect, safety, and accountability. And here's the thing. This, is, this, this kind of thing doesn't only happen in Baptist churches, but also in Catholic churches, and often causing one, and also in the SDA ones, right? And many other. You see, the issue is not that it happens in churches. The issue is that it happens, and there is no accountability. <laughs> God holds his children accountable. And even though we are forgiven of our sins, of course, there are always consequences from our mistakes. If God holds us accountable, we should also hold each other accountable. The Benjamins fell into looking, failed into looking in their own tribe to see who had done this horrible thing. And in the name and in the same way, we in the church, in our homes, and even in ourselves, we should look and practice accountability. Because failure to do so will lead to more death, more sin, more disasters. Look at a chapter verse, chapter 20, verse 46. So all who fell of Benjamin that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. And all these men were men of valor. 25,000 souls in exchange for the evil doings of some perverted men of the city. You see, when we fail to practice accountability, more disasters come our way. The story finishes with the victory of Israel against the, their brother Benjamin. Nonetheless, they don't kill them all. About 600 soldiers survive. And somebody from Israel intercedes for these men saying, Hey, it's not right that, that we disappear one of the tribes of Israel. It's not right that we kill all of the offsprings of our brother Benjamin. Therefore, in order for them to grow, you know, they, 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 they find wives for them, right? The problem was that the whole nation of Israel had vowed that they were not going to give their own daughters to the evildoers of Benjamin. So what do they do? Well, the Israelites invaded one of their own groups who did not join the war against Benjamin, a town called Gilead. They kill all men, including the animals, and give the Benjamites their women. But there isn't enough women. So what do they do? Well, look at chapter 20, uh, 21, verse 19. Chapter 21, verse 19. 
And it says, Then they said, In fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem, and south of Lebona. Verse 20. Therefore they instructed the children of Benjamin, saying, Go, lie in wait in the vineyards, and watch and just when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dances, then come out from the vineyards and every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh, then go to the land of Benjamin. Mercy. In other words, go kidnap some women for yourselves. Wow. And look at how the book ends. Look at how the story ends in verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Wow. You see, friend, by this statement, we are able to understand that these people kept God out of their ways, their evil ways. But what's most hurtful and sad is that these people are professing to be men and women of God, you know. And yet they walked so distant from his steps and the things as they planned. There are three things I want to leave with you today. Number one, if you are ever in a situation similar to the one who, to the one that the Levite was in, between two hard decisions where he had to decide whether to come out and be raped or his concubine to be the one who's raped. Well, let me tell you that God always has a better solution to your problems that you can find. You know what that is? The same, the same situ Because the same situation happens in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the same thing, the same offering is made to the mob. Here are my virgin daughters. But the angel of the Lord were in their midst and they said, absolutely not. There is a better option, and everyone was saved in that home from the mob. I heard the story of a German lady who was hiding a Jewish family in their home back when the Germans were looking to kill Jewish folks. And she was hiding a family in her home. Jewish family. Eventually, the police came and knocked on their door. And when she opened, they asked whether she had people in hiding. At that moment, she is between two hard decisions, right? What do I do? Do I lie, which is a sin, and save a family? Or do I say the truth, right? Do I say the truth and have the family murdered? But you know what? She involved God, and God gave her another option. She looked at the police straight in the eyes and said, Sir, you may search my house and see for yourself. The police replied, Ma'am, I don't want to look in your house. I want to know if you have people hiding. But She replied, Sir, you are more than welcome to come in. In fact, come in. She opens the door. But the policeman replied, ma'am, simply tell me if you have people in hiding in your home. Sir, come in and see for yourself. Finally, the policeman replied, have a good day, ma'am, and left. Sir, come in and see for yourself. Have a good day, ma'am, and left. You see, friends, with God, there are always a better option. Number one. Number two, accountability. We must hold ourselves and each other accountable. If we want to be men and women of God, of course. Yes, there are consequences for our sins, but accountability is a must in the life of the Christian person. And number three. Stand up for the weak. Defend the ones who are being oppressed. Fight the oppressor. Stand up and rebuke the evilness of the bully and those who put other people down. Hmm. And today we have many of those, right? 
You see my anger fuels when in social media I see posts and news about immigrants who are not documented, being treated like less, like they are not humans, separating them from their own children, blacks being shot, Asians being shot, people walking into the schools to kill innocent people. And that is what we see in the news and imagine what we don't see in the news. And by the way, this is not a political issue. This is a human race issue. This is not a church. This is, this is the church's issue. How can we call ourselves the people of God if we don't seek him for other options, if we don't hold each other accountable, and we don't stand up for the weak and innocent? When we, don't do, when we don't do any of these things, we, the church, don't do any of these things. We are no better than the Levite who threw out his own concubine to be gang raped. I know it hurts to hear that. But it's the truth. That's the reality of our spirituality today. What are you going to do? Hmm? Will you live your life like you have no king and do everything according to what you think is right? Or will you submit to the Lord, not only in mind, but also in spirit? Not only in mind, but also in spirit. And not only in spirit, but also in the body. The kind of submission that will lead you to seek Him for, alternative, for alternatives to exercise accountability and defend the weak from the oppressor. The kind of submission that will fill your anger when you see an innocent life being oppressed, being taken by an oppressor. The kind of submission that will lead you to defend a kid who is being bullied and have compassion and extend a hand to an immigrant who is only looking for a better life for him and his family. The kind of submission that will lead you to say, I am not a Democrat. I am not a Republican. I am a Bible-believing Christian who loves the Lord with all his heart and all my soul. Social justice is not a political thing, friend. Social justice is a biblical thing. Are we going to be the church who will fight? Are we going to be the church who will seek God's guidance? Are we any better than the Levite who took his own girl to be thrown out and being gang raped? Come on, church. Come on, friend, what are you doing? What are we doing to be better than that Levite who does not deserve any grace from the Lord? I know I don't want to be like that Levite. I want to be a better person. I want to be a better priest. I want to be a better child of God. And I think that there's still time. I think that it's time to stand up, to wake up, and be a better Levite. If you want to, right there where you are, stand up. If you're sitting down, go ahead and stand up and raise your hands. And tell that to the Lord. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, and I lift our hands. We lift our hands, Father. Because we want to be a better person than that Levite, Lord. Father, we want to seek your guidance for better options. We definitely want to ex exercise accountability, Lord. Oh, Father. And we want to stand up and fight the oppressor. Father. Please bless us with your wisdom, with your guidance, with your Holy Spirit. 
Please, Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you may wake us up. You may open our eyes, Lord, that you may use us for your honor and your glory, Father. We lift our hands this morning and we give you praise and honor and we give you permission, Lord, to use us for your honor and glory, Lord. I pray for our churches. I pray, Father, for accountability. I pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit guidance and I pray, Father, for the injustice of this world, Lord. May you come soon to put an end to all of these things, Father. Father, we love you. Bless you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen and amen. Friend, I am so glad that you chose to be here today. We're going to continue in this series called The Bible Says What? Part 2 next week. I hope that you were blessed. Leave me your comments, say hello, and I will definitely say hello as well. God bless you. And hey, don't forget, be happy with the small things that you have. See you next week.